Okay, chapter five, <clears throat> how securities are traded. Okay, so brokerages, by law, you can't directly buy or sell stock on the stock markets. You need an agent or a broker to actually trade the stock for you. So brokerages firms are there to bridge the gap between you and the financial markets. So for you to access the financial markets, you have to have a brokerage account. And through the brokerage account, you have to access one of their agents to place a trade for you. And they earn commissions on your trades. So every time you trade a stock, they can earn commissions. It can be anywhere from you know, $7 to $35. Before the SEC abolished fixed uh, rates of commission, commissions were as high as $75 per trade. And when they allowed brokers to uh, be competitive against each other, the SEC no longer dictated what the commissions were and the discount brokers were developed commissions have, have steadily fallen since the 70s to today where they're, most of them are around $7 or somewhere, and some even cheaper, depending on who your broker is. They, brokerage firms will also earn money on sales loads, on mutual funds, um, underwriting fees, administrative account fees. They're sort of like, they're like a bank where they, there can be a lot of embedded fees and services that they offer. I mean, if you have a brokerage account, it can, these days, you can pretty much do everything a bank account can do. You can have a checkbook, you can have a debit card, you can do bill pay, um, you can do uh, many things, just about everything you can do at a bank, you could do at, in a brokerage account. Now, the full service brokers, um, not only do they execute the orders for you, but they also give you investment advice and account management. So if you're going to go to the full service broker, those are the high-end expensive brokers, they are going to, can do everything for you. The discount brokers can basically just follow your direction and execute the orders that you want. So the discount brokers are more like the virtual stock market that we're working with as a simulation in class. Now, some examples of full service brokers, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley Smith, Barney, Edward, uh, Edward Jones, uh, Raymond Jones, Wells Fargo Advisors. These are all expensive full service brokers that if you're uh, if you don't really want to have a hands-on approach to your investments, you hire one of these full-service brokers and then the stock broker will um, do the research for you, advise you, keep you up to date, give you research, and may even make trades for you. And they can, and most importantly, some, some of these uh, stock brokers are very good at giving you investment advice as far as buy this stock, okay, now it's time to sell, and and sometimes they can even trade on your account without your direct consent. If you just say, okay, you know, you can get an account where they can just trade back and forth and do what, whatever they please. Is, and they de I guess the deal with you is as long as you make me money, I don't care what you're doing in my account. Just keep making me money. So full service brokers will have stock brokers. And if you are a stock broker who gets a reputation of making all the right moves, you can be fabulously wealthy as more and more people, the word gets around, hey, this guy's good, he made me X amount of money, I got a 50% return last year, and then his friends tell their friends, tell their friends, and these brokers can be very highly successful. Unfortunately, typically only one in 100 brokers get to this level of success. The other 99 are just sometimes good, sometimes bad, and they don't really have as big of a following. Now, the discount brokers are the majority of where people normal average people have their brokerage accounts and make their trades. So discount brokers, um, they, can, they give you all the services of a full service broker except for advice. They can't really provide advice to you and, and you have to tell them what to buy and what to sell. So they're not providing any advice. But they do charge a lot less for the execution of the trades. Charles Schwab, Fidelity, E-Trade are the three biggest discount brokers. And they're basically, you open up a brokerage and then a lot like a virtual stock market, you type into the internet the stock symbol you want, the amount of shares, and the type of order you want, and then they'll place it for you. But they won't really tell you whether you're doing, you know, that's a good idea or a bad idea, or, you know, I'll give you any uh, research reports or any particular advice on what to do. Now, there are different account types that you can get. For most investors starting out, you should have a basic cash account, which is just you can only trade the money you have. And you, you add funds to your, your brokerage account. And these brokerage accounts can be linked to your bank accounts, no matter who your bank is. And you can upload 
uh, funds directly to your brokerage account, or if you make money in your brokerage account, you can download it to your bank account. So you could link them up quite easily. So if you do have a bank account, you can move funds between the broker and your bank uh, very easily. Uh, the, a lot of the brokers like Fidelity or Charles Schwab can also be linked to your company's 401k. They can also house your IRAs. So there's a lot of um, versatility with what they can do for you as far as your retirement as well. But the cash account is just basically whatever securities you buy, you pay for 100% in cash. Now a margin account, this is an account where the broker will lend you money. Now, because of the crash of 1929, the, the, um, the Federal Reserve uh, dictates a maximum of 50% can be loaned against your equity. So if you have $100, they can loan you another $100. So that, that full position of $200 is 50% your equity, 50% borrowed money. So in the margin account, you can leverage yourself uh, up by 100% of the cash you have in there. So if you have $1,000 in there, they'll lend you $1,000. So you have a $2,000 investment, 50% is your equity, 50% is the dollars loaned to you. And with, why this is dangerous, of course, is that if the stock goes down, you're losing twice as fast than if the stock goes up compared to just a fully cash position. Because leverage is a very powerful thing as far as getting returns. And Back in the 1920s, you could leverage up 90% or higher. And that's how everybody, that stock market crash happened, because everybody was lever leveraged up so much on the market. If the stock market's moving up, you want to have more money in the stock market. So they would lend you money, and if you had, you had only 10% of the equity, say you had a million dollar portfolio, but only $100,000 is the cash you brought to the portfolio or your equity, and the other 900,000 is borrowed money that you used to buy stock, that's great if the stock market's going up 10, 20% a year. That's fantastic. But if the stock market pulls back, all your equity is wiped out, then the stock, broker, the stock brokerage is going to sell your shares. And then you're going to be left with um, not only owning no stock, but also owing money to the brokerage. And that's how all these brokerages went bankrupt and all these people lost all their fortunes and this excessive leveraging. And that's why they, they, they pulled it back to 50%. So that way, uh, you would never be left with a neg negative position in your brokerage account and, you, and the stock market won't make a big bubble from all this money being loaned. Now, in the real estate market, it's different. You can put, in during, before the housing bubble, or during the housing bubble, you can put zero money down and have 100% loan dollars to buy a house, or maybe 2% or 5% down. So your leverage, your equity in the house was leveraged up very high, so when the housing prices came down, that's what sort of that extreme uh, leverage in the real estate market is what really helped fuel that real estate bubble. And since then, banks have been requesting a lot more money down on the house. No more 0% zero, zero down mortgages, no more 5% or 2% down mortgages. They're looking for at least 10 to 20% down. You know, and it's made the, uh, as a result, the real estate market has pulled back tightly. Now, an asset management account automatically reinvests the excess cash balance in, in a money market fund. So there are, there are other types of accounts. There could be, um, sometimes it's called that. If you're a full service broker, you could get what's called a wrap account, which is you could pay one service fee for all the trading and all the transactions for the full year, as long as you're tied up with a broker who's going to manage your account. So they do have different uh, services for the very expensive full service brokerages may have additional service accounts. But by and large, most accounts are either cash or margin. Now, with the cash account, you can write checks. Um, you, like I said, you can have debit cards. You can uh, pay bills online. I mean, there's a lot of bank functionalities with these cash accounts because it's really, you know, if the cash isn't already vested in the stock and the cash is just sitting there, they give you options of how you can move that money up. Though the wrap account is what I was talking about for, for before. The, um, all the costs and fees are all wrapped up into one fee for the year. So they may charge you $2,000 for the wrap account for the year. Then any transactions you make during that year are all included in that wrap account uh, fee. 
that's unusual. Most people don't have wrap accounts. They exist, but those are for the ultra wealthy. Right. If we talk about brokerage fees and costs, the biggest one is commissions. And they uh, will differ by uh, broker and, and, and because the brokerages themselves can set their commission schedules. And it could also be additional commissions. Some brokers I know, like Fidelity, and some of them they have it where the first, the, the 795 commission is for the first 1,000 shares you buy of any stock. If you want to buy 2,000 shares or 10,000 shares, there's an additional per share charge of a couple pennies commission for every share above 1,000. So they do have, sometimes they have some fine print about the, the, um, the size of the purchase as well in the commission. Now, if you're an institutional investor, you have a much greater ability to negotiate the commissions lower. So in institutional investors who do a lot of trading, a lot of business with a broker, they can, they can actually get an even better deal. There is something called a dividend reinvestment plan. And these are an unusual thing. I think I only have one slide on it. The dividend and reinvestment plans they're a loophole on how to buy stock directly from a company. So you can avoid commissions and administrative fees and the broker, you can avoid the broker altogether. It's a small, tiny loophole where you can actually contact the company directly, like McDonald's or Exxon, um, and you can say, I want to buy stock from you directly, and you can be put into their drip or dividend reinvestment plan, and you send the check directly to the company, and they will house your stock account directly at the company. Now, this was originally designed for employees, so employees could buy stock directly from the, the company and not have to go through a brokerage or have a brokerage account, because most people didn't have a brokerage account. So if you worked for a big company and they wanted, to, you, they wanted to make stock available to either give to you or for you to purchase from them at a discounted price you, and, and to reinvest the dividends, you could be part of their drip program. And then later they opened this up to everyday investors. If you wanted to contact individual companies and participate in their dividend reinvestment plan, you would just send those companies money directly. Now, why most people haven't heard about dividend reinvestment plans is because they're, it's, they're barred from advertising. So the, the brokerages got nervous. They put pressure on the government. The government said, OK, we're going to let these things exist, but we're, but we're not going to let them tell anybody about it. So that's what, so that's what, it's sort of anti-competitive, and the brokers didn't want to lose business because people figured out that they could buy stock directly without commissions or brokerage fees or account fees, especially when the brokers were very expensive. A lot of people would do that. So they're not allowed to advertise, so companies can't advertise the fact that you could buy stock from them directly. Now, for companies, it's actually a great thing for a company if you buy the stock from them directly because it's sort of like a mini IPO because they get the money. They could create new shares for you, and they, or they might have shares in your treasury stock, so they're going to directly get the benefit of selling the stock to you because it's not going to be in a secondary market. It's going to be more like a primary market sale. So big companies do like dividend reinvestment plans because they get um, capital from when you buy their stock from them directly. Plus, if they pay dividends, the dividend reinvestment plan, like it says, it reinvests the dividend directly into more shares of stock. So when they pay a dividend, they don't actually have to pay any cash out to anybody. They just give you more shares of stock to match the amount of dividend paid. Another great uh, advantage to them. So in that case, um... the dis a big disadvantage of doing this, though, is that if you, if you want to have a diversified portfolio, meaning that you need at least 20 stocks, you're going to have 20 stock accounts at 20 different companies. That means it's a nightmare come tax season. You're going to get 20 different statements, 20 different tax uh, obligation statements that you're going to have to put together when you do your taxes. So it becomes a real paperwork nightmare to have many different drip accounts. If you're trying to avoid commissions completely to have all these different dividend reinvestment accounts and not deal with brokers, you're going to have all this additional paperwork at the end of the year. One big advantage of having a broker like Charles Schwab or Fidelity is every trade that you make, at the end of the year, you could download that information directly into your tax filings through TurboTax. And if you don't directly download, you're going to have to sit there and pair up every purchase and sale for the year and calculate every gain or loss, which could take hours. So they've made the tax preparation, especially if you're a high frequency trader, you have more than 50 trades a year, it could be quite a task to fill all the paperwork and separate long-term, short-term, and all your gains for the proper tax purposes. So 
well, I think one of the biggest advantages of these brokers is that they do, with one simple download, you go to TurboTax, you type in your broker, you put your account in there, and they download all the information of your taxable activity for the year and put it in all the correct schedules in TurboTax for you automatically. So it really makes it easy to file your taxes once you have capital gains or capital losses. Now, we talked a little bit about this, the uh, orders in the auction market, uh, the New York Stock Exchange volume, um, they're matching the buy and sell orders accordingly from the specialists. So they'll, they'll hire a specialist to run the market, to create the, the, buy, the um, supply and demand economy, and they'll match the orders together through computer, tra you know, computer enhancements to, to help match all the orders. And they do it in a very, the SEC has outlined specifically how they're allowed to create this market and to create a fairness of the customer gets the lowest price available at the time of purchase. You know. Now, so the specialists though, but they act as both the broker and the dealer. So the specialists come from the brokerages. So they're gonna act on both sides as a broker and a dealer um, for the stocks that are specifically assigned to them. So certain broker, like Fidelity can be a specialist in say 40 different stocks. And they're, they have taken on the task of in creating a buy and sell economy for these stocks through the rules of the SEC to make sure that it's completely fair for the people buying and selling the stocks. So they're going to maintain the order book for the limit orders, the market orders, the stop loss orders. They'll keep all that. It's all done by computer, but they'll keep a record of all that. Um, and they'll keep a fair and orderly market to provide liquidity for the stock, which means in some cases may, they're going to be holding inventory so they can make sure that things move very liquid. The, um, now, there's something called the super dot on the New York Stock Exchange, and this is one of the electronic order uh, recording, reporting, routing, and matching systems. So this is the computerized aid I was talking about that helps the market. No one can do this physically anymore. It used to be completely physical, papers, people, hand signals, trading pits, you know, uh, and everything would be entered in later. Now, that's just silly with all the computer and communications network we have now. We have computer assisted trading. So the specialist electronic book is what records and keeps those limit and market orders that we talked about on the book. So when they, so we know that when the stock reaches a certain price, they can be um, enacted quickly. No one has to sit there and lift, look through a bunch of sheets to see whose order they're waiting on. And the, the, the super dot and the computerization is what allows really these specialized type of orders to be entered. So pre-opening uh, pre buying and selling orders can be uh, matched and imbalanced reports to the specialists can be created. So if there's activity outside of the trading range, it can handle that. Um, and the members send orders directly to the specialists and the members are the brokers, especially to the uh, specialists for execution and confirmation. So who's ever the specialist in that stock, they're responsible basically for doing all the paperwork and make keeping the market open and keeping it liquid and keeping the stock traded. And that's how they keep things orderly. And everything is, has a record and everything is you know, recorded. So there, if there's any issues, any problems develop, when the IPO of Facebook came out, there were a lot of problems. But you know, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, they're gonna record, everything's recorded and everything has, you know, every transaction, it, you know, has a record. So they can go back and fix things if there's an issue or a problem. And that's the great thing about having all this computerization and record keeping. Now, the over-the-counter market, which the NASDAQ lives in, is a slightly different market. It's sort of like, think of the New York Stock Exchange as like McDonald's. That's like the number one, you know, the leader of the market. And then the NASDAQ sort of like, I guess, number two is Burger King. Basically the same stuff, fries and burgers and shakes, uh, you know, same type of business, but they do things a little differently. But you don't know, as a customer, you really don't notice too much. You go in and you do place your order, it seems like the same type of business exactly. But there are differences. So in the over-the-counter markets, which includes the NASDAQ, which includes the bulletin boards, which includes the pink sheets, um, dealers are hired and they're for profit um, to, to um, create a market, a buy and a sell, uh, economy uh, uh, for each of the stocks. So a de um, these dealers are basically, they're going to take some risks to create this business and they have to be registered by the SEC and, and approved by the over-the-counter marketplace. But basically, they want to start a business trading stocks, creating 
a buy and sell economy for stocks, and they're going to compete against other dealers as well. So, but by law, whatever the best price is on the ask price, since you're buying something, you're going to be paying the ask price. Uh, you, they have to look at what's available by all, from all the dealers and give you the best deal. They can't make you pay a higher price than, than the, the best price that's being offered is going to match up with the next person who wants to buy it. And we talked about the, big, the bid and the ask. The bid is the, um, the highest offer for the dealer to buy the stock. And the ask is the lowest price the dealer is willing to sell the stock at. So the way they arrange this is the ask price is always higher. When you're looking at it, you can see the ask price could be at five, and the bid price could be at five, uh, could be at uh, say 450. And that 50 cents between the two is the spread. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be selling to you at five and buying from others at 450. So that you buy at a 450. So if you're the dealer, you're buying at a 450, you're selling at a five. You're making that 50 cent spread, which is unfortunate for you because if you buy at a five dollars as a customer automatically, if you want to turn around and sell at that same second, you'd be losing 50 cents on each share. And that is the spread. So a dealer will make a market for the security. And there could be, if it's a popular stock, like say Cisco, you could have 30 dealers or 50 dealers and they're all trying to make a market. And the spread can go from 50 cents down to one cent. So one cent spread for a very popular stock means there's a lot of competition in trying to get the orders. And there's so much volume in the stock that it's still worthwhile for these dealers to get involved. If too many dealers get involved in one stock and a bunch of them aren't making any profits, they'll just drop it and find another stock to work with. So this sort of economy of the supply and demand of dealers creating a supply and demand market for trading the stock is what keeps everything fair and efficient. And the record keeping of everything is make sure that there's no funny business in, on, on the price you pay as a customer. Now, in 2001, they switched from a fractional system to a decimal system in stock trading, which was always sort of really weird before 2001 when you would trade stocks in fractions like five and a half, five and three fourths, five and 15 sixteenths, uh, uh, you know, five and three eighths, five and uh, uh, five dollars and uh, four eighths, or it would be really one half. So they, everything would be denoted by a fraction. It would be a one sixteenth. 3 sixteenths. So there are all these crazy fractions when you traded stocks. So if you were a stock trader before 2001, you got very good with your fractions and converting fractions to, to change, decimals. And after a while, I said, okay, we're just like the metric system we haven't adopted yet. We're just really behind the times in this country as far as mathematical systems to represent our, our um, numbering systems and financial systems. And eventually, they said, finally, in 2001, they said, OK, we've had enough. Let's switch it over to decimals. Now, so that, which allowed for the spread to be as small as a penny. And it can't be any smaller than a penny with the decimal system. Okay. Well, it makes it more easier for everybody else, because now there's no more conversion of fractions into uh, money, change. Okay. Now these, the order types, we discussed these um, in, in, the, in the handout. There are three main order types, market orders, limit orders, and stop orders. The market orders are immediate transactions that you get the best available price when you want to buy it. Just like in my example I used before, when you go to the store and you want to buy something, you get whatever the best available price is for the item you want to buy at the time of the, you enter the store. Uh, meaning that if the price is on the bag of potato chips you're buying, you can't go up to the register and then they say, well, now we're going to charge you $5. That's the best price is 99 cents. That's what you're paying. And you, you basically, whatever you pick out, you're going to buy it, you're going to pay that price. And the order is going to complete. Now the limit order allows you to specify a specific price uh, for the before the transaction is authorized. So you could say, I don't want to pay any more than $2 for that bag of chips or that stock. And you won't pay more than that. You will pay the exact $2 or better. Just like that example of sending over someone over to the store and they can ask for, you know, you say, I only want a cup of coffee if it costs $2 or less. And you, you will buy it if it's $2 or less. If it's more than $2, you won't buy it. It's simple as that. It's a limit order. 
And we discussed that there's a day limit order there's, uh, and there's a good to cancel limit order. And there's also a fill or kill limit order. So the fill or kill asks once, the day order asks all day until they get their price, which may, not, may or may not happen. And the good to cancel generally means six months the order is open for. Okay. Now the stop order, <clears throat> it, it can, you can specify a particular price for a long position to sell the stock at if it reaches that price. If it's a short position, the price that you're going to buy the cover at. So in the stop, you're just basically saying, say the stock is $100 right now. You place a stop order at 50. What you're saying is, I don't want to sell the stock if it's above $50, because maybe it's going from 100 to 500. You don't want to sell the stock if the stock's moving higher. However, you do want to sell the stock if someday, say it's a good deal cancel stop, order, someday that this order, this stock reaches $50, I want out automatically. And maybe it's a very risky company like a pharmaceutical that has a cure for cancer and it, FD, the FDA is about to say yes it's going to work or no it's not going to work. So that way if you have a stop order on this, maybe you own the stock for a while and you've made a lot of money on it, but you want to put that stop order in because if the FDA comes back and says no, the stock's going to go down to $5 from 100 to 5 in, in 30 seconds. So you want to have your order placed there to, to cash you out so you can lock in your profits. <clears throat> However, you don't want to sell in case it's a yes and stock goes to 500. So it's a way of guaranteeing locking in gains you've already made in the stock if you can't watch the stock market all day long. And the stop orders can be set up where an uh, ordinary stop order just turns into a market order. If you want to pay extra, you could have a stop limit order which turns the stop order into a limit order guaranteeing the price you're going to get. So think of the stop as really not so much an order but sort of like a placement holder saying once you reach this, create a market order and sell it or create a limit order and sell it. So you decide whether you want market or limit. Limit's more expensive than a market order. Okay. So settlement, um, the settlements take three days. So if you buy a stock, you don't officially, legally own it for three days, although you own it. So if you buy a stock and it goes up the next day, you could sell it and still make that profit. It's just the paperwork uh, is three days behind. And this is just an, old, an older circumstance of everything was done in paper, in pencil, and recorded. So you can ima imagine that at the end of the day they had stacks and stacks of all these papers and it took time to sort everything out and officially record it that you're the owner of the stock and especially if you're getting stock certificates in your name, that the, that the stock certificate is in your name and things like that. So legal ownership is transferred from the financial arrangements, settled with a broker firm, and this book to entry system, you know, uh, it's gonna, it typically takes, it definitely takes three days. Um, so the clearinghouse is sort of what sits between you and the broker and make sure that everything gets officially recorded and that you get what you're paying for. But, you know, technically there's a three day settlement period. Not that that really affects you. You, you could buy a stock and sell it the same day and still make money. Um, but behind the scenes, I guess it deals more with the physical stock certificates. So if you buy a stock and you want to maintain, maintain the ownership of the physical stock certificates, it's going to take three days to really be officially recorded as the owner of those stock certificates. And then once you have a physical stock certificate, that's sort of like cash. You could sell that to somebody else and they can take that stock certificate to the broker and put those shares in their account. But no one actually has, not no one, very, very few people will deal with physical stock certificates because of the uh, dangerous nature of them being destroyed or stolen or, you know. So what happens is that all the stock certificates are held in the broker's name. So when, you're, when you buy or sell a stock, the broker actually is the one on the stock certificate, not you. And the broker just promises that, yeah, we're representing that you own these shares. And that's how they're able to do the short selling later since all the stock certificates in the broker's name, they can actually go behind your back and sell it to somebody else if they want to sell it short. Okay. Um, now that, what you might see with the settlement in your broker's account, you may see that the funds, they, they may be encumbered, but they're not, they're not converted to the stock directly in the cash so that you can see your cash balance uh, is waiting for a settlement. 
So that's more likely where you see the three-day wait is in the actual change of your cash balance in your account, whether they're settling it from cash into stock. So you don't, you know, you don't lose it right away. Now, the investor protection regulations, because people are unethical, especially when it comes to businesses and stocks, and a huge number of people were ripped off in the 19, uh, since, stocks, since stocks first traded, started trading in this country up until before the SEC was created, a huge amount of people were ripped off with scams and problems in the stock market. I mean, it still happens today, it's much rarer, but the reason the, we had, part of the reason we had such a huge uh, Great Depression was this fraud and this uh, extreme unethical behavior in the stock market. Just like we had the Great Recession was uh, fraud and illegal behavior in the real estate market. Uh, now, whenever something like this happens, regulation is developed to help prevent it from happening again. Just like regulation was created in, after the 2008 crisis, Frank Dodd Act is one of the things. And regulation was created after the, the um, Great Depression. So in 1934, they created the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission. And they're going to administer all the laws related to the financial markets, monitor public securities transactions, uh, issue registration uh, for public offers, meaning IPOs, uh, investigate indication, um, incidents of uh, violations of insider trading and other issues. So they created, basically in 34, they created the SEC, and their, their job is going to be regulate and monitor the financial systems. So then in 1936, the Maloney Act, um, extended control of the SEC, not just from the New York Stock Exchange, but also to the over-the-counter markets as well. So now the SEC controlled all of the stock markets, uh, and they provided for self-regulations of the OTC. So the self-regulation means basically the SEC is in charge, but they let the OTC develop a lot of the um, double-checking, consistency, and regulations for members on the OTC. And as long as the SEC is happy with what the OTC self-regulation is, they don't get too involved. Um, but if an issue does occur or something happens, the SEC is the ultimate say, and they can overrule any self-regulation on the OTC. Now, uh, as we talked about before, the OTC dealers are, are known through the National Association of Security Dealers, or NASD. Uh, and they're light, they, they issue the licenses and they regulate members of the over-the-counter uh, firms. And the SEC has authorized the NASD um, must uh, report all of its rules and, and self-regulations to the SEC for review. So it's sort of like they outsource part of the self-regulation to the over-the-counter and they monitor them. You know, it's a lot like if you go to a movie theater, you know those ratings on the movies, R, PG, G, those are the self-regulation of the movie industry. So if you're someone, say you're in a box office and you sell 10-year-olds uh, tickets to an R-rated movie, what happens to the person at the box office? Can they be arrested? Can they be fined? No, because it, it's, they're self-regulated, so it will be up to the movie, the, the movie theater to decide what to do if they want to fire or penalize that person for doing that. But it wouldn't be the case if you worked at a 7-Eleven and you sold cigarettes to a 16-year-old then you can get in huge trouble because that is directly controlled by the penal system. You know. All right. So in 1940, the Investment Company Act um, looked specifically at um, mutual funds. And so if, if, if there is, the mutual funds started getting more and more popular by this time, so they wanted to make sure that the mutual fund companies didn't take advantage of any investors in the buying and selling of the shares of the mutual funds and how they orchestrated the fees and the costs and things of that nature. So that's why all the fees are, have to be reported and expressed in a certain way according to the SEC. So they provided a framework where these investment companies can operate in for the protection of consumers. So they have to design their, their products in a way that's going to be beneficial to the shareholders. Uh, is the future market uh, regulated by SEC? Yes, uh, it is. The, 
more on that later. The Investment Advisors Act of 1940 requires individuals or firms um, who would sell advice to, the, to be registered with the SEC. So the Investment Advisors Act, they found that, you know, the, in the beginning, the SEC was worried about how companies uh, were, were they real or not? Were they fake companies? So they put a lot of laws in place about how a company can be registered and issue stock. That was the first step. The second step was the Investment Company Act to make sure that mutual funds behaved properly and treated consumers uh, correctly in how they dealt with buying and selling members of mutual funds. Then the third uh, place in line was stockbrokers. They found a lot of stockbrokers were lying, being fraudulent, uh, doing whatever they could to get a sale. So they put a bunch of laws in place um, to, to register and regulate the stockbrokers. Uh, and then if you take the Series 7 test, which enables you to buy and sell stock for somebody else, they fingerprint you, they do a criminal background, they do a lot of uh, investigation on you before they can let you be a stockbroker. Uh, and that's why the SEC is in place to make sure that people aren't getting ripped off, uh, especially by stockbrokers or investment advisors. Um, so if you are compliant with the law, then you can be an investment advisor. Um, they can't deny anyone the right to sell invest investment advice um, unless, they dis unless they have documented dishonesty or done something illegal or fraud, then they could bar you from selling or being a stockbroker. So anybody can really become a stockbroker if you follow the proper, um, pass the test and, you know, but anybody else, you don't have to be a stockbroker, you can still give investment advice, but if you do something that's dishonest or fraudulent, the, the SEC can fine you or put a lawsuit against you, put you in jail, you know, yeah, the people have gone to jail for, you know, lying and manipulating the stock market. And then they can deny you from ever allowing, being allowed to provide advice again. Um, the Securities Investor Protection Act in 1970 uh, establishes the SPIC. You know the FDIC? That's the thing, that's the, guarantees your bank accounts. The SPIC guarantees your brokerage accounts. So if the brokerage has failed, the government will step in through the SEC and reimburse you for your accounts through the SPIC Act. The, Secur the Securities Act amendments in 1975, this is what allowed for discount brokers to, to be developed. It abolished the, um, the fixed rate commission system and allowed for brokers to compete on whatever schedule that they want to organize for the selling of um, their services, specifically commissions. All right. Now, to, to answer your question, the SEC is also, they do all the financial markets. So it's not just the stock exchanges, it's the bonds, it's the futures, it's the options exchanges. They're looking at, all, they control all of them. I'm specifically here talking about the laws that, that affect the stock markets. But they have separate acts and regulations that affect all the markets. Um, now, to go back to the self-regulation of the, the over-the-counter market, it, they, the SEC is in control, but they do allow the NSAD to do a lot of the heavy lifting as far as policing and regulating and controlling its members. Um, so it's in their own self-interest to make sure they do a good job with the self-regulation. Because if they don't, the SEC will step in and make things a lot worse. So they've been, uh, it's only been a few times the SEC had to get involved with the over-the-counter market directly because of something that the NASD wasn't properly regulating. Now, they do have um, something called circuit breakers in uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And this is to prevent uh, in 1987, October 1987, the stock market went down like 20% in one day. You know, we used to have these really violent times where the stock market go, go down um, a huge amount uh, of percentages and points in one day because they started um, utilizing more and more computerized trades. So for, think of all these stop orders. People put all these stop orders in and the market starts to free fall. All these stock orders stop uh, orders get hit and enact and they just sort of create a panic and a huge amount of wealth can be wiped out in one day. 
So these circuit breakers, like a circuit breaker in your house, are designed that if the stock market falls by a certain percentage, the stock market gets shut down in the middle of the day or delayed an hour or shut down for the whole day. So they have different levels of you know, where they're going to stop trading if things get too crazy to give people to stop all the computerized trading and give people a chance to reset their trades and rethink what they're doing and then they'll, they'll open the market up again. The last time I really saw this uh, happen a great deal, um, it happened a few times after the 2008 crisis and more, it was more actively happening in 2003 with the Enron and WorldCom and all the accounting fraud that was going on. But these are meant to kind of prevent um, big crashes in the market. You know, we, we, had, we did suffer a flash crash. It wasn't really enough to enact too many circuit breakers, but that's what they want to avoid. Any type of flash crash where all these computer systems all decide to sell at once. So since, you know, that can happen in a split second, and devastate the financial markets and wipe out trillions of dollars of wealth, they, they have these circuit breakers in to help prevent that from occurring. Okay, now moving on to margin accounts. That's the type of, one of the types of accounts that I talked about that you could have. And in the margin account, it allows you to borrow money from the broker. Um, so you have to have in order to initiate a position with borrowed money, 50% of the position has to be your equity. And the other 50% can be money loaned to you. So between the cash and the, and the, and the dollars loan, that's 100% of your position. So there's two ways of thinking of it. If you had a $10,000 position, $5,000 my cash, $5,000 I borrowed from the broker. So that's a 50%, 50%. Or you can think of it sort of like this way. You know, I have 50% cash, I can borrow 100% of that up to 10,000 to create my position. So that's where the 100% and 50% come from. It depends on how you look at it. You know, if I start with 5,000 and I can borrow another 5,000 from the broker, I'm basically borrowing 100% of my equity. But your position now becomes, when you take all the money in total, your equity is really only 50%. Okay. So the Federal Reserve is the one that actually sets the minimum on the margins on, on securities. And in 19, it was unchanged since 1974, 50%. So it's not the SEC who controls this, it's the Federal Reserve. So if the Federal Reserve wanted to really help create a big stock bubble, they could lower this down to 25 or 10%, and then people would be borrowing more money and buying more stock and creating more wealth in the stock market. People would feel more wealthy and it could help the economy, theoretically. But it could set, the, set it up for a big crash. Now the actual margin at any time can't go below what's called a margin and maintenance level. And that's set by the exchanges and the brokers. So there's a maintenance level where you're going to have to um, bring more cash into the equation. There could be a, uh, a margin call and they're going to ask for more equity to be brought into the account to balance out, um, to maintain the levels that the broker feels comfortable with. So you could start out by having a 50% equity position, but that's allowed to fall lower. You could go to 45% or 40%, but at some point the broker's going to stop it and they decide where they want to stop and say so you have to either, you know, either give us some money to this or we're going to liquidate your account. So there's some misconceptions about margin. A lot of people have these misconceptions about margin. One, that the broker must contact you before selling securities. In fact, the broker they, uh, most brokers, of course, they will attempt to contact you, uh, but they're not obligated to do so. They could just sell without contacting you. So if, but it's in their best interest to contact you and say, give us more money, because they would really tick you off if they just sold and didn't send you at least an email or a text message or a tweet. Um, two, uh, I choose which securities to meet my, obli my margin obligations. Uh, and in fact, the broker chooses what securities they could sell, not you. So you have even less control than you think. Because uh, the broker is trying to protect their interest in their money first. So they'll sell whatever they need. So if, they, if the shares that you actually took money against weren't enough, they'll sell something else or take some cash out of your account. Um, I'm entitled to an extension of time. In fact, a customer, you're, uh, you're not entitled to an extension of time um, to be granted in, in most situations. Okay, number four, my broker must notify me before increasing my firm's uh, maintenance requirements. Um, and in fact, the broker could do this at any time and not contact you. So if their margin maintenance was 30% and they wanted to move it up to 
they could do that. And not tell you not, you know, they don't have to notify you. A uh, brokerage firm must set the same margin requirements on all stocks in the account. That's not true. They can set different main margin requirements uh, for different accounts. So riskier stocks will have a higher will have a higher margin requirement, maintenance requirement, and much safer stocks could have a lower one. All right. So those are just some misconceptions. So yeah, I, I do remember that back in 2000 when I was dealing with margin, the internet stocks had higher margin maintenance than the blue chip stocks. So brokers do definitely analyze the risk and set the margin maintenance. Uh, and the margin maintenance is basically the percentage at which your equity is allowed to fall to before they require you to put more cash in your account. And it's always below, the, it's generally at or below the uh, minimum 50%. Okay. So these are the formulas involved in the handout for the, the margin maintenance. Okay. So we have, this is the one I talked about earlier. Uh, the initial margin is the money that you put up in cash divided by the value of the transaction. So the initial margin, this first formula, if, if you put $5,000 up cash divided by 10,000 the total transaction, that's a 50% initial margin. You know, you could actually, you don't have to borrow 50% of the position. Maybe you put $7,500 up in a $10,000 transaction and the initial margin is 75%. So you don't have to borrow the full 50% um, of, of dollars loan. Now the actual margin percentage, which we talked about before, um, is the value of securities which I had over here, the value of securities minus the amount borrowed divided by the current value of the securities. And that will give you your, your actual margin percentage at any point in time. And this changes, every time the stock price changes, your actual percentage change as well. And then the last formula, the uh, amount borrowed would be the margin call price, um, I'm sorry, the margin call price would be the amount borrowed divided by the number of shares multiply by one minus the margin maintenance percentage. We'll give you the, the price at which the stock, if it falls, because a lot of people want to deal with not percentages, but tell me what price the stock I'm worried about if the stock reaches that price. And you could say. Sorry for the interruption. Um, like I was saying, the margin call price, if you want to deal with a dollar amount, not a percentage, then you could say, use the formula margin call price to calculate the exact dollar at which you would get a margin call. So if your stock price falls from say 43 to 25, 25 is a point at which you, you're lower, you meet or you're lower than your margin maintenance and the broker would expect you to put more cash or equity into your account. Okay, so see the class handout for more examples uh, and formulas on this and we'll go over that at a separate time. Uh, short selling. So Short selling is when an investor borrows stock from the broker to sell. So this is unusual because the investor can sell first and then buy to cover later. So you are able, and you can do this in the virtual stock market game we're playing, uh, Market Watch. Um, you can actually sell something short, sell it first. So this is opposite what we do in our everyday life. In our everyday life, we purchase something and then maybe we sell it if we want to or we keep it. And this in the stock market is unusual that we can actually sell first and buy back later, what we call buy to cover. Well, why is this important? Because if the prices are going to go down, then it would be a great thing to sell it first because you could sell it at a high price and buy it back at a lower price. So this happens in, in investing all the time. When we have bear markets or stocks that are going to go bankrupt like a Radio Shack or you know, stocks are just not going to have an easy time and we expect the price to move lower, we can sell short. Even commodities like oil can be sold short if we expect the price to drop. And a lot of money can be made this way. And it gives us the ability to make money whether the stock market is in a growing phase, like a, a bull market, or in that you would want long positions. But if the stock market's in a bear market, <clears throat> the market's going down, you'd want to take short positions. And the stock market typically goes down a lot faster. It could lose 30% of its value in, in a couple of months. And it may have taken it three to five years to, to gain that 30% of value in a, in a bull market, but a bear market could take that way in months. So short selling is a way to make a lot of money 
very quickly in a short amount of time. Now, short selling is riskier because if the stock price decides to move up, there's an unlimited amount of loss you can you can get you can you can be responsible for because if the stock price it is no zero, so you buy a stock and it can go down to zero, you know the most you can lose. So if you buy a ten dollar stock and it goes to zero, you lose ten dollars per share. But if you sell short a ten dollar stock and it goes to five hundred, now you just lost four hundred ninety dollars per share, and it can still rate go higher. So there's unlimited potential losses in short selling. So that's why it's considered riskier. And you can't do short selling unless you have a margin account. That's another stipulation. But basically, what happens is all the the shares of stock are held in the brokers by the brokers in what we call the street name. So they can borrow someone else's stock and sell it short, uh, sell it to you to sell short in the general marketplace. So there, so since everything's in their broker name, they just borrow stock from somebody who bought it long. They give it to you, and then you sell it to somebody else, and your account is sold short. So in the brokerage accounts. The person who owns the stock, it still looks like they own the stock. They have no idea. In your account, you just have a short position open waiting for you to buy to cover it. So you're hoping in the meantime the price will go down and you will be um, able to cover and make a profit. So when you sell these in the open market, you want to repurchase later at a lower price to make a profit. And this is a huge advantage for investors. So no matter, no matter what the market's doing, if it's a bull market, you want to be long and owning stocks. If it's a bear market, you want to be short and selling stocks short so you can make money on, as prices move lower. As the prices move lower faster than they move higher, you can make a much more money by short selling. Now, short interest ratio is a, is a way to measure the bearishness of investors in, about a stock. So the short interest ratio is calculated by taking uh, the, you know, the amount of shares sold short and dividing it by a daily average volume. <clears throat> and this indicates the number of days it would take for the short sellers to buy back or buy to cover their short position. So the higher this ratio, the more bearish they are in the marketplace. So if we're going to look at a stock, um, i trying to think of a good stock to look at that would have, you know, well, let's see, I don't know. Look at maybe Southwest. Their symbol is love, L U V. That's why they have the big hearts on their planes. Now you go to you go to um, key statistics. So just scroll down to key statistics on any stock, and then you can see they over here on the right hand side the short ratio. So right now uh, it's only one. 0.2, meaning that the shorts could cover in a, in a day and 20% of the next day. And the short percentage of float, the float is the amount of outstanding shares available for trade, is only 1.7%. So this has a very low short ratio and a, a very low uh, percentage of float. So it means that investors are very still bullish on shares of Southwest. So if you look at a quick chart, You can see that Southwest has probably done well in the last. They've done very well. If you see the stock price here has gone from uh, around twelve dollars to uh, forty-three dollars, and that coincides with the drop in oil. So if we look at we look at some market data. I want to get a, a good stock. Let's get, let's get over the, ah, this commercials. So why, you know, this is why Yahoo itself has been beat by Google because of the, the, the annoyances on their website. Okay, let's look at stock ZU. I'm not sure what this company is, but it had a really bad day. And let's take a look at their short percentages. So we'll go to key statistics. And scroll down and we see that 
Okay, so their short ratio is much higher at 9.3, meaning there's nine days. It would take almost nine days for them, the shorts to cover. That's a big amount of days. And the short percentage of, of float is 149%. Extremely large. Uh, the share sold short uh, of 14 million out of a float of 49 million. So that, those numbers, they're, they almost, they're so high they almost seem wrong. Um, let's look at, let's look at Dunkin' Donuts. We'll just check their, their key statistics. So we can pay, we can compare. Say we're going to analyzing coffee and donut coffee shops, and so we can look at Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks. So if we look at Dunkin' Donuts, we see that um, their short ratio is 2.5, so 2.5 days to cover the shorts to cover their position, which means that if all the shorts were going to buy to cover and get out of their positions based on the average volume, it would take them two and a half days, and their percentage of float is about 5.8%. Now most companies are going to run. If you see a sh all companies have shares short, so anywhere from one to five percent is you know about average. Most companies exist in that have a short short percentage of float in that area. Typically, one to four percent is pretty. I'd say bullish. Uh, four to eight percent is a little neutral, and then you know maybe four to six percent is neutral, and over eight percent is a little bit more bearish. So. People are okay with Dunkin' Donuts, but if we look at Starbucks Corp, let's see their key statistics. And we see that uh, Starbucks, oops, their short ratio is uh, 1.4, and their percentage of float is 1.2 so people feel much more bullish about Starbucks with a float a short percentage a float of only 1.2 percent compared to Dunkin Donuts which is closer to five between five and six percent so here investors are telling me that they feel more confident about Starbucks and Starbucks's future than Dunkin Donuts and so this is one way to get a sentiment of what investors now short investors typically tend to be a little bit more experienced a little bit more knowledgeable investors so a lot of people like to look at that short percentage of floats see what the um, more sophisticated investors how they feel about a stock so it's an easy way to, to gauge uh, get an idea I'm switching over to yum brands that's a uh, Taco Bell Pizza Hut um, Long John Silver's. You may have to put this on full screen to see these these ver these ratios here. Okay. okay. And you see, actually, Yum Brand is about the similar ratio to Starbucks, 1.4 to 1 percent. So this is why it's important sometimes to go to go to um, to look at a bunch of different stocks. And this is why it's important in your well, while we're doing, we're going to later on do a project, uh, an analysis project of, of industries and companies, because you want to see for the industry and for the company, each industry, each company resides in the industry or sector, and the sector is going to have their own averages of short percentage of float and short ratio. So it's hard to compare apples and oranges, but you're looking at all, all sorts of companies in similar uh, uh, industry, you can kind of compare, that's why I looked at Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts to kind of compare to see, you know, what the averages are or get a feel for the industry. Here again, McDonald's is 1.6 and short percentage of 1.2. So not so far off from um, Yum Brands. If we look at, say, Chipotle, this is Chipotle Mexican Grill is, a, is probably the, the most um, dynamic in this retail sector of fast food. And they, they tend to have, you know, a stock price has gone up tremendously and generally that makes it a target for some shorts if stock prices rise too quickly and we could see here that the short ratio of uh, Chipotle is 2.7 and the short percentage of float is 3.9 which is higher than Yum Brands and McDonald's which are 
not as not as aggressive of a company as far as their stock price, but you know people agree that Chipotle Mexican food grill has a much better future potential. But this having a higher short ratio and percentage of float than McDonald's and Yum could suggest that people feel that Chipotle Mexican grill is a little bit overvalued and is heading for a possible pullback. So okay, so that's that's it for today's lecture. Just want to give you some ideas about. Uh, how you can make money short selling and how short selling and short ratio and percentage of short of float can give you ideas of how uh, investors who do trade short